with the library expansion and also was a director of the Wisconsin League of Municipalities, so uh, Doug will be missed. Also, um, we have a new reporter. Um, Amber Levenhagen is here tonight, everybody. She's sitting right in the front row. Um, you'll be um, mm -hmm. seeing quite a bit of Amber lately, so she's taking over for Alex, <clears throat> and we wish him well. Um, County Executive Parisi was scheduled to be here tonight, but there's an illness in his family, so we're going to reschedule that. So and he, uh, he's going to come down. We're going to talk about the efforts that are going to take place to uh, control the water levels coming through the river. And then also I wanted to remind people that we are having an open house for the new City Hall and Public Works uh, building on June 13th from 5 to 7 p.m. Um, that was June 13th from 5 to 7 p.m. Um, that's all I had. I know we, uh, Jill from Public, uh, from Stoughton Utilities wanted to uh, make a few comments about the events that occurred this weekend. And I personally want to thank Jill and the rest of the uh, staff that were, and employees that were involved uh, with the cleanup since then. But uh, go ahead, Jill. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, City Council. I just want to take the opportunity to thank a number of individuals and kind of share with you the incredible teamwork that we experienced. Uh, for starters, I want to thank the community and the, um, our customers for actually their patience. Uh, people were very patient and very thankful and grateful for the uh, restoration activities. Basically, the storm event, our first outages happened about 2 a.m. Our final restoration activities were about 6 p.m., so about 16 hours that uh, we actually had staff out there working. I really want to thank the police department, the fire department, and public works. Uh, with their help and support, we were able to be more effective, and they were actually very helpful. And we had some um, trees on fire and a variety of different things that they were help, able to help support and make safe certain situations. Also, internally, I wanted to thank our electric division. Um, they did a phenomenal job. I really can't speak highly enough about what they did. The teamwork that they brought together and the leadership, uh, one individual in particular really led that storm. He was the leader in the field and coordinated the crews. Uh, did a phenomenal job. We also had help from our uh, water division and we also had help from our uh, internal leadership uh, throughout that whole outage. The magnitude of the, uh, the damage was actually so substantial that we reached out to mutual aid and uh, through MUW we did have uh, Broadhead light, Water and Light, Evansville Water and Light, Jefferson Utilities and Wanakee Utilities come in and actually help support us. That equated to nine line techs and five trucks additional for that restoration activities. So again, I just wanted to really extend my, my gratitude for all the individuals that were able to come forward and help support the restoration activities and just a phenomenal teamwork top to bottom to, to be, basically be able to restore and deal with everything that was there in a relatively short period of time. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jill. And are there any communications from council members tonight? Yeah, I'd like to add. Person it. Schumacher. <clears throat> So going on with, with Jill's, uh, you know, I thought this was a really coordinated effort for, for this, from the city entity as well. But as I was out and about on Saturday looking at, well, at the damage around, I wanted to say that the community certainly showed uh, a, lot of, a lot of their pride too as, as they all banded together to help, really help one another out. So that was, uh, that was really a, a great thing to see. Thank you. Uh, any other communications from council members? Okay, seeing none, we'll go in. There are no presentations then. Minutes and reports are in the packet, and that'll take us to our public comment period. And has anybody signed up? Okay, nobody signed up for our public comment period, but if you would like to speak, uh, I would invite you to come up to the podium now, and you would have three minutes to speak on an issue. And seeing none, we'll keep moving. Um, takes us to the consent agenda and there are three items in the consent agenda I'm looking for a motion to approve the consent agenda. Approved. motion by Jensen second a second by Bartlett would anybody like anything removed from the consent agenda and voted on separately hearing none all in favor say aye aye, aye. any opposed none opposed that carries uh, it takes us to old business and we have looks like three four items coming from public safety um ordinance 14 of 2019 and that would be all the person jensen <coughs> uh, thank you your honor 
<clears throat> Public Safety presents for second reading, Ordinance 14, 2019, amending Chapter 70-180 of the City Municipal Code relating to no parking, 3 a.m. to 5 a.m., by creating subsection 4, and I would so move. Second. Second by Alder Person Riley. Okay. So this is, uh, I'll let the Chief speak to this one. This was... Uh, I'm just looking it up. Hang on just a second. Yep. This is the 3 a.m. to 5 yep, a.m. parking. For the uh, new city hall lot? Yep. Yes. Yep. You just explained it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Any questions on this one? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. Uh, ordinance 15 to 2019. All the person Jensen. I thank you, Your Honor. Uh, public Safety would like to present for the Council's uh, consideration Ordinance 15 2019, amending Chapter 71 176, Parent 78, City Municipal Code relating to parking uh, restrictions on Whole Avenue, and I would so move. Second. Second okay, by Alder Person Reeves. This is um, by request of the uh, post office. Uh, they're setting up a group uh, box, I guess it would be called. Yeah, that's and for a group uh, mailbox in that location. Yep. Uh, it would be just uh, south of the uh, Splash Pad Park. <clears throat> okay. Any questions on this one? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed? That carries. Ordinance 16 of 2019, all the person Jensen. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, again, Public Safety presents uh, Ordinance 16, 2019, amending Chapter 70-176, Parent 79, the City Municipal Code relating to the parking restrictions on Otteson Drive between Hole Avenue and Jens Court. And I would so move. Second. This again, the same thing. Um, it's for uh, a public mailbox uh, on request by uh, the <coughs> post office. So, and this one is near where they're having the um, the uh, parade of homes this year. Yes, that's mm -hmm. correct. Okay. Any questions or comments on this one? Here, none. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. Uh, ordinance 17 of 2019. Okay. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, <clears throat> Again, public safety is. Would like to present Ordinance 17 2019, amending Chapter 70 176, the City Municipal Code, creating subsection 77, relating to parking restrictions on the west side of Halts Road. And I would so move. Second. Second by, was it Hirsch? Okay. Yeah, this is to help the businesses along there to restrict the parking to one side. Any questions on this? You guys are awful quiet tonight. Yep. I guess that's a good thing. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> None opposed. That carries. Thank you. Uh, resolution 74, 2019 comes from Finance. All the person Schumacher. Finance recommends Resolution 74, 2019, authorizing and directing the proper city official officials to acknowledge the receipt of 2018 City of Stoughton audit. So move. Second. Second. Mr. Lisa. What's that? Uh, second by all the person Reeves. Go ahead, all the person Schumacher. Um, we went through uh, a, a briefing. Auditor is, is here for questions. Um, it was a it was a heavy document. Okay. <laughs> Jamie, you want to introduce the auditors for us? Uh, sure. This is Carla Gogan. She's a partner with the municipal group with Baker Tilly. Good evening. Um, as Jamie mentioned, I am Carla Gogan, a partner with Baker Tilly. I'm the partner on the city's financial audit. I've been before you in the past. I do welcome questions. So I'm guessing you, you've saved up all your questions for me and for Jody, who's going to follow. I'm going to cover some of the city uh, financial benchmarks, and Jody's going to cover the utility aspects of the audit. We did go through it in detail with the Finance Committee. I'm going to keep it a, a little bit higher level. Um, in your packet is a report to City Council document. Um, and I believe Jamin's going to put it up on the screen as well. 
Um, in addition to that, we also issued a, a communication letter to those charged with governance, and we went through that document in detail uh, with the Finance Committee. I'd be happy to entertain any questions from that. With respect to the financial audit, we did issue a clean or an unmodified opinion on the financial audit. That's the highest level of assurance uh, that you can receive. It's what you've received in the past and what you should expect to receive. When we look at the financial health of a municipality, and I work with about 55 different municipalities around the state of Wisconsin, really looking at three things. Looking at fund balance of the general fund. Your general fund is your main operating fund, um, so it's reserves. What does it have in terms of cash reserves? Uh, we take a look at your debt position, and then we take a look at the health of your capital assets. Uh, so the first page uh, is the detail of the general fund fund balance. As I mentioned, your general fund is your main operating fund. It's where you have your public works, public safety, general government type costs, your operations. And at the end of the year, if you take all the assets, which is primarily cash and some receivables, uh, less the payables, what you have is your fund balance in the general fund. And you had about $6.2 million in fund balance, and it's broken up into the various categories. Uh, the first uh, being non-spendable, this is primarily inner fund loans, loans that the general fund has made to two of the TIF districts. Um, and so as the TIF districts generate TIF increment, they will pay those loans back. Uh, the assigned amount of $1.2 million, that is primarily made up of a payment in lieu of tax, about $850,000 from the utilities. Uh, that the general fund records as revenue in 18, but like taxes, you spend it in the, in the year after you've received it. And what's left is your unassigned. You had budgeted actually to decrease your fund balance overall by about $9,000. It went up by about $370,000. That was primarily, uh, finally we're seeing some decent interest rates. Uh, at the bank, so you had some uh, interest earnings and then just some other miscellaneous revenues coming in over budget. So if we move to the next uh, slide, we're going to look at our first metric. Uh, we take a look at your unrestricted fund balance. So this is your unassigned, which does not have any strings attached, plus your assigned fund balance and compare that to the expenditures in the general fund. And you're at about 53% if you look over to the far right. If you look at the graph below, you'll see this is the trend from the last five years. I always think it's important. It's important to talk about the results for the current year, but it's also important to take a look at what has been going on the last five years. And your unassigned or unrestricted fund balance to expenditures has stayed fairly consistent. Um, it's actually gone up a bit. If you go down on the page, though, you'll see you have an internal policy. And that internal policy says that your unassigned fund balance in the general fund should be between 20 and 25 percent of the general fund's budgeted expenditures and you're at just over 26 percent. Uh, that's because in the general fund there's also some funds that the general fund helps to subsidize. So if we take a look at the unassigned fund balance in the general fund and those other deficits, ultimately you're just over that internal policy that you set. And that is important. When you issue debt, which you do, uh, you'll do ratings calls with Moody's, um, uh, they will look to see what policies you have and are you following your own policies. So very healthy fund balance uh, in the general fund. Before I move on to the next metric on debt, any questions on the fund balance metric for the general fund? All right, then moving on, I said there are three metrics we look at. The next is on uh, debt, uh, your debt. And you have general obligation debt outstanding. Your general obligation debt is secured by the taxing authority of the city. Uh, because you are a government and because you can lay, levy taxes to pay your debt back, uh, the interest rates of which you're able to borrow to, to pay for uh, public projects is a lower interest rate than what you might otherwise uh, have. And so that general obligation debt, you have about $34 million when you add up what the city has, plus some in the utilities. You have some funds on hand, so if you back that off, you're just over $34 million. Your geo debt capacity is at $58 million, and that's driven by state statute. Per the state statute, any municipal government has to stay within 5% of its equalized value. So you're at 59%. Um, you do also have an internal policy. Um, and that internal policy would say that as of the end of the year, you could, within your policy, borrow up to $46 million in comparison to the $34 million. 
that would put you at 80% of your debt limit. That's what your policy allows for. You are not at what your policy allows for. You are at something less than that. And also to keep in mind, within that debt, you have about 7.5 million that are related to TIF projects. So it is anticipated that the TIF districts will generate TIF increment, and that TIF increment will be used to repay that general obligation debt. We move on to the next page. This is another debt metric. Um, and this just takes a look at, if you look at your overall spend in the general fund, and you think about all the costs that you have, wages being a, a large portion of that, wages, fringe benefits, um, other services that are provided, snow plowing, other public works activities, parks, public safety. Um, we take a look at your what you paid in debt service, principal and interest of about 3.5 million. And we compare that to your non-capital expenditures, and you're just under 23%. So if you look at that met the table down below, it's, it's recommended by bond rating agencies to stay in that 20% range, and you've hovered right around that 20%. Again, this is, this is healthy. Um, this is similar to if you were to go, um, you know, to take out a loan, uh, your banker would look to see how you're spending your money on different things and say, you know, this is what would be a reasonable car loan or this is what a reasonable mortgage would be. It's kind of the same principle here, you know, on your annual spend, what are you spending on debt service? And, and that's, that's right in the recommended uh, area. Any questions on the debt service metrics? You're within your policies and overall, um, you know, uh, look positive compared to your peers. Yes. Go ahead. I had a question on the general obligation. Yes. The trend from 2014 to 2019, it almost doubled. It was 18,000 in 2014 and it was much higher this year. Is that in keeping with other municipalities? That just struck me that it was almost double, but yet we still had favorable mm -hmm. patterns that you Sure. We're definitely seeing, and I'm going to let Jamin comment on the amount of, of debt outstanding, but what we are seeing is if, if you look in the last 10 years, I and mean, we talked about this a little bit at the Finance Committee meeting, you know, one thing you can control are the projects you approve and how much you borrow. What you can't control is your geo debt capacity. That's driven by equalized value, which is driven by growth in a community. Um, governments are usually a leg to what's happening in the global, you know, in the economy, the local economy. So as the economy slowed down in 2008, 9, 10. You saw, and I don't have the statistics here, but most uh, geo debt capacities or equalized values went down. For the majority of clients I worked with, they all went down. So that gap shrunk between what was allowed and what uh, communities had for debt. And it took them a while to grow out of that. So I would say that we were seeing less debt being issued for that reason. Um, now it's been on a positive trend of uh, growth. As you can see, your geo debt capacity has gone up. That means that you know your equalized value has gone up. Um, so if you look at your geo debt capacity is 45 million in 14, it's 58 million uh, in 18. So that's that that indicator that your equalized value is growing. Um, so we are seeing more uh, borrowing for projects as a result of growth. Uh, that is occurring, but I don't know if you want to mention anything just about the overall debt, Jamin. Yeah, so the city has been pretty aggressive the last three or four years in terms of borrowing. Of course, one of them is the public works building, which needed to be done. Um, we did have the KPW project, which is a, was a significant borrowing from a debt capacity standpoint, but the TIF is actually funding that on its own. Um, just to give you an example, I think our equalized value in 2018 increased by 10%. So even though our borrowing has gone up, as Carla noted, our capacity is going up as well. Um, we are aware of this. This was one of the first things I tried to tackle as I came in. We worked with our treasurer, our assistant finance director, um, and I think we, over three or four meetings at the finance committee level, we worked on the debt management policy. And we, we've set a couple metrics that we want in terms of kind of at least trying to stagnate our borrowing for the next few years to kind of at least stay at a, at a certain level um, to kind of build up that capacity as well. So it's definitely on our radar. Um, I think even though we were aggressive the last three or four years, I think there were borrowings that we needed to do. Um, and now we're, we're kind of trying to take a step back, but still do the same types of projects that we need to do. And I think when the representative from Springstead was here for the debt issue, I mean, she, she did point out that 
we're an old com community and we're a growing community, so it's kind of a double whammy. We have old streets, old infrastructure that we need to replace and, and keep keep intact, um, but we're also growing too, and we need to provide the services and the infrastructure along that, that those lines as well too. So we're we're trying to manage that and walk that that line, but also manage our our debt as well. So, and I would add that we're internally we're having more collaborative conversations <coughs> with. Planning Department, Public Works, Stoughton Utilities, and Finance to try to get everybody represented at the table. And then also some of the people that are really out in the field with the boots on the ground that can give us a better analysis of really what kind of condition, especially our utilities are in, because you can't see the utilities, but you can see the roads. So I think those are the types of things that, as a staff, we're going to try to continue to improve and, and have more of those types of conversations so we can make better decisions. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Carlo, by not borrowing or by not acquiring debt, issuing debt up to our policy limit, is there an advantage to that from like a credit rating standpoint or not really? I'm not your municipal advisor, so I know it's something that they look at. They look at your debt load, they look at the growth that you're having, and they look at um, you know what your policies are and you're managing within your policies. So they're certainly considering those things. Um, I don't know, Jamin, if you have anything more to add on. Yeah, if you actually read our credit report or cre credit report this year for the debt issue that we we had, um, they mentioned our debt burden a number of times, four or five times. Um, but they also mentioned the growth, um, stable tax base, things like that. Fund so, balance. Fund balance. So we, we do have the fund balance, which is, it's it's kind of our saving grace right now in terms of keeping our, our credit rating where it is. Um, the goal of the debt management policy is, is to kind of, like I said, stagnate the actual borrowing that we're doing for a while in the hopes that maybe we can free up some of our fund balance to start spending it down. Right now, we've, we've kind of been treating it like our piggy bank from, a, from at least a, a credit rating standpoint. And that's not the only reason, but it's one of the reasons. Um, if, we, if we can kind of hold steady from our, our debt level and continue to see our equalized value grow, um, and our tax base grow, we can start dipping into that fund balance a little bit. As Carla noted, we're at about 27% right now. We can feel a little bit more comfortable pulling in, digging into that to, to fund some special projects. Um, so it, th that's the overall goal is to get there where we actually feel comfortable pulling out of that fund balance and using it for other purposes. Any other questions? Okay, then just a few things I would like to highlight. We're going to go pretty quickly over the next two slides. Um, this is just your revenues uh, for the city. You can see uh, down below on the graph just taxes and intergovernmental revenues being your two largest revenue sources. That's not a surprise um, uh, in the state of Wisconsin. And then as you keep going down to the next page, it just shows you in a different format in a pie chart. And then as we move on, the expenditures in the general and debt service fund um, down below is show some lines, public safety uh, being the uh, largest expenditure followed by debt service, followed by public works. Very common that public safety is um, where a, a lot of the dollars are, are going. And then in the next uh, graph is just again a, a pie chart showing how the dollars in the general fund, your main operating fund and debt service are being, paid, are being spent. So then as we move on to page nine, this gives you a total picture of all governmental activities in the city. So at the very uh, far right, the top total assets, this is all the assets of the city. Uh, this is all your capital assets, less your accumulated depreciation, it's cash, it's receivables. Less all the obligations and liabilities of the city of 51 million. Um, and so this would be all of your debt um, any other obligations, compensated absences, accounts payable, and you have an overall positive net position of $31 million. Um, when we talked about the health of your capital assets, that net investment and capital asset line, you can see from 14 to 18 it has grown, uh, which demonstrates that you are investing in capital assets. If you weren't spending any money on capital assets, you would see this no number decline because you're depreciating or expensing that asset over the life of its asset. You can see it's gone up, which would mean an investment in capital assets, and when it's coming down, uh, again, that's because of depreciation. Your restricted net position, um, th these are dollars. Uh, you, uh, Wisconsin it has a fully funded retirement system, 
And so depending on market results, uh, at the end of 18, there were positive uh, market results uh, for the pension plan. So every community, every government that belongs to Wisconsin Retirement actually has a net pension asset. Uh, that's not the case uh, in, I think, you know, Wisconsin is one of two or three states with an uh, extremely healthy retirement system. That does positively impact you also, I would imagine, you know, on your ratings calls because you don't, you're not burdened with a uh, pension. <coughs> and then your unrestricted net position is, is a positive number. Then just the last uh, page I wanted to comment on is, this is just a <coughs> snapshot of your TIF districts. Uh, so you have six active TIF districts. If you look to the, the, the top of the page, lists all the sources of revenue coming in, followed by all the uses of funds, and then you get to the very bottom, and the third line up from the bottom shows the long-term debt outstanding. So that's all geo debt associated with those TIF districts. And then it shows either a positive or negative number. If it's negative, it means that the, the revenues are not yet sufficient to pay for its costs. That's pretty common in a TIF district. TIF districts, the whole purpose of them is but for a TIF, there is no development or little development. So the TIF is intended to spur economic activity. Um, and so it's common in the early life of a TIF that you're investing in the TIF. Uh, to draw in development, and then as the development grows, it starts paying the TIF increment, and then that's used to pay the cost of the TIF district. Um, so the city prepares an annual report. All governments are required to uh, submit information to the Department of Revenue by July 1st of every year. Uh, so if you wanted to go out and, and look at all the TIF activity around the state, um, and the city is also required to meet with the Joint Review Board or the overlying districts. Um, to talk about the status of the TIF districts each year, and, and they'll be doing that um, in a few weeks. So, any questions about what we went through pretty quickly tonight? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your time. We did go through it, like I mentioned, another document, a required communication document. And I think just to mention there is. You know, as, as we're doing our audit, it is a risk-based approach audit. If there's questions or concerns that you have uh, as a city council, we welcome uh, you to reach out uh, to us as the city's auditors. Okay. So I'm going to turn it over to J Jody. Okay. So we'll, we'll finish up on this one quick because we have a motion on the floor. Perfect. Thank you. And then uh, is there any questions or comments on the motion? So it's R74 of 2019. Hearing none, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed, that carries. All right, and the next one is R75 of 2019. This one came out of Stoughton Utilities and all the person, Hirsch, is gonna introduce it. Um, I'd like to introduce R75 2019, authorizing and directing the proper city officials to acknowledge the receipt of the Stoughton Utilities 2018 audit report and management letter. I so Second. Second by all the person. Was it Jensen? Okay. There's a motion and a second. And Jamin, you want to introduce our guest? Yep. This is Jody Dobson. She is the partner with Baker Tilly on the Energy and Utilities Group side. Thank you very much for having me here tonight. Um, so similar to what Carla went through for the city, I'm going to focus on the Stoughton Utilities. Um, which also received what we call a clean or an unmodified opinion on the financial statements. And just to walk through, um, again, key financial highlights here, we always start with operations. And so I think if we scroll down, sometimes the graphs are a little easier to see. Um, the first item I have here is just the kilowatt hours or gallons sold for the utilities. Um, the electric utility did have an increase in sales of about 4%, and that was really across all types of customers. Um, the water utility had a slight decrease in water sold in 2018 compared to 2017. Um, and that's really what we've been seeing across the industry is when you have a wet summer, um, water sales are down. And then the wastewater gallons build um, was fairly flat from 2017 to 2018. Most of those categories will follow water sales. Um, industrial sales do not because they have some different processes in the industrial customers. So knowing then what the sales were, looking at the results of the operations or the rate of return for the regulated utilities, the electric and water utilities that are regulated at the state level, um, 
The electric utility is currently has rates that were established in April of 2017 and were designed to provide a 5% rate of return. So 2018, they earned just over a 5% rate of return. It was about 5.06%. Um, and then for the water utility, those rates were put into effect in late 2018, again designed to earn a 5% rate of return. And the actual rate of return was a little below that. Um, it was 3.91%, but it was an increase from 2017 at 3.2%. Um, so I think in 2019, you'll really see the full effect of those new rates that were put in place in late 2018 for the water utility. Another way that we'll look at operating results is the debt coverage. Um, because the utilities have issued revenue bonds, which are secured by their own revenue streams rather than your taxing authority, they're required to have demonstrate that the revenues uh, provide enough coverage for operating expenses and the debt service plus a small cushion on that debt service, if you will. So the water and the electric utilities are each required to have a debt coverage of 1.3 times debt service as the bare minimum. Um, the electric for 2018 was 2.8 and the water was 3.1. The wastewater's minimum requirement is a 1.1 times and they were actually at 2.07. Um, so in all three of the utilities, that's very positive that they're meeting that requirement um, and they're actually having additional um, revenues come in there which provides for the payment in lieu of tax to the city, um, any ge general obligation debt service that they have to pay, and reinvesting in capital um, additions for the system. The next benchmark we look at for the utilities is the unrestricted fund on hand. Um, and the recommendation here from the Government Finance Officers Association is to have a minimum of three months worth of operations in unrestricted reserves or cash reserves. And that allows for any unexpected items that may come up as well as the normal cash flow cycle when you're providing service and then billing and being paid after the fact. So as we compare here, the actual reserves, um, the electric at the end of 2018 had just under five months. The water had right about three and a half months. And the wastewater had just under 10 months. So all of those are meeting that benchmark that we look for as a minimum of three months. Um, and we do see some ebbs and flows along the way here, and that's fairly common as a utility may build up a little bit and then have a non-routine uh, maintenance project come up in a year and draw those down. So that's normal. And the last item that we'll look at here is how is the infrastructure of the utility financed? Um, comparing the debt versus equity of each of the utilities. Typically here we like to see no more than 50% of the infrastructure financed through debt in a utility unless there's something very unique going on. So as we look at your utilities, the electric um, has at 28% debt and it's been decreasing. The water is at 6% finance through debt and the wastewater was at 25% debt and it's also been decreasing. So I think overall when we put those things together, um, you've got strong returns, positive debt coverage, meeting cash reserves and a low amount of debt um, and trending in the right direction. So very positive results. Are there any questions so far? Okay. <laughs> okay. I guess that's it. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we have a, a motion on the floor. Um, last chance. Any questions on utilities? Hearing none. All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. <clears throat> that takes us to item number 11, which is the public hearing. So we'll close the regular meeting and then we'll reopen for the public hearing. The public hearing is set up to get public input re related to the amendment <coughs> of the City of Stoughton um, comprehensive plan for Kettle Park West development area. And is there, nobody is signed up to speak. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak regarding this? Okay, uh, hearing none, we'll close the public hearing 
and then we'll reopen for our regular business. And just as a reminder for the council members, there will be another uh, public hearing as required by the statute as we get further along in this process. Um, but we were asked to include something on for tonight's meeting. And um, so we did. Um, so we'll go to item number 12, which is discussion and possible action regarding the 2020 budget schedule. And this comes from uh, finance, Alderperson Schumacher. All right, so the 2020 schedule looks like we've got CIP has already begun with that and uh, waiting on the due date, waiting for the information to come back. And we've got some meetings that are scheduled later on in order to discuss when all the information is back together. Um, three meetings out in October for that. Anything else you want to add, Jamin? Um, yeah, so the schedule is pretty similar to what we had last year. Um, I think we got a little bit of a head start in disseminating the information out to city staff. So I think we, we have a little bit of a head start there. Um, we are scheduled for three committee of the whole meetings at this point. I think we wrapped it up in two last year, but better safe than sorry in case anything comes up. Um, I believe we have two CIP budget committee meetings scheduled. I think we ended up doing three last year. Um, we did leave kind of a gap between that second meeting and then the actual approval of the CIP of about a month in case we did need to squeeze another one in. But, but other than that, it's, it's pretty similar to past years. Okay. And just uh, for the alders, the CIP committee is made up the, of the chairpersons from the standing committee and not all the standing committees have met yet so that's not fully established and then by uh, council policy then the um, council president will be the chair of the CIP and that's the that's basically where we do the borrowing and the bonds um, so that's what will take place at those meetings and we'll have presentations from the department heads about um, basically the the needs of their department for uh, the capital improvements for for those items um, and if anybody has a conflict with any of the dates, uh, please let Holly know as soon as you can. We want to make sure that we have quorums at all these meetings so we can, and same thing with staff, we want to make sure that everybody is available as much as we can to make sure these meetings go off without a hitch. Alderperson Jensen. Yeah, it says here possible action. So I'll make a motion to accept the budget, as, uh, budget schedule as presented. Second. Second by Alderperson Reeves. Any questions or comments or anybody going to be missing that you know of at this point, any of these meetings? If not, you can let us know later. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. Um, R76 of 2019 also comes from finance, Alderperson Schumacher. Uh, Finance Committee recommends Resolution 76, 2019, authorizing and directing the proper city officials to enter into an agreement with Archive Social for social media archiving. So moved. Second. Second by Lagaki. All the person Schumacher. This was um, in, in crafting together the, the social media policy. Uh, and, and this would be to, we, we've got to have a backup of a certain amount of this and for a certain amount of time uh, that to be defined yet by the policy. Uh, so this company would be, would set up the framework for getting that archival set in place. I think it was about okay. 6,000, I think was the amount yep, on it. 6,000 was the amount. And then this was a recommendation by the city attorney as we were drafting the policy mm -hmm. um, to make sure that we have record retention. And then just to give everyone an update where we're at on the actual policy, um, it was reviewed by uh, Community Affairs Council policy. And um, they're going to take one more look at it based on there were some language issues there that they wanted the city attorney to review, which he has. So we anticipate that the CACP will review that policy again um, at the June meeting and then hopefully bring that back to City Council for consideration. Once the Council approves the policy, we'll have 
basically <laughs> 45 days to transition from what we've been currently doing to ad adapt our practices to the new policy. So we want to make sure that uh, leadership um, has an opportunity to make sure that they're ready to do that before the council takes action. So we're hoping to have that um, at one of the June meetings unless something else arises. But getting the, uh, the social archiving was, was one of the components that we needed to make sure we have in place. And depending on the timing of when we actually approve and begin to do the, the social archiving, that number may go down slightly. And they definitely had a better fee structure than the other companies that we looked at in there. There's the other ones were a bit more confusing as to what I think mean, could be more nebulous as far as what uh, actual amount is going to cost us. Okay. Does anybody have any questions or comments? So the, this was coming out of contingency, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we have a healthy amount in there yet, but that's where the, where it's coming out of. We budget basically $80,000 a year for contingency costs, which are typically something that we weren't really anticipating. And I think that's the case when we started to draft this policy. Um, we discovered during the process that record retention was going to be a major component of that policy, thus the expense. Go ahead. Is the next step that with these two companies, they fall within financial thresholds that make sense to us and would it be the IT department choosing one or what are the next steps to selecting <coughs> who will be archiving? Well, that will be the we're going to authorize archive social for do you, or do you mean who's going to do within? Um, no, I do mean between these two companies either archive social or smarsh. So we're, we're authorizing to go with archive social for that. that. That's the recommendation from the IT wanted to make sure as I read through I wasn't certain Smarsh had confused me okay mm -hmm. that one was confusing okay it's just a confusing word it's a <laughs> unique word mm -hmm. <laughs> very memorable all the person Hirsch yes thank you and thank you for putting this all together um, I just want to make sure that um, this yearly expense will be put into our regular budget and not be taken out of contingent as going forward so I just want, and I know you probably will do that. So yep, yep, we'll, we'll put it into 2020 and going forward. Okay. I think part of my confusion, um, I noticed social archiving is the name of the company, but in the resolution I actually see the word social arching. Social. And I just was... So in the resolution, mm -hmm. it says social arching in the, in the in fourth the whereas. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now my confusion is clearer to me. I see. Okay. So we need to make that, a, that typo. Yeah, we'll right. clean Good that catch. up. <coughs> my brain here. is scary sometimes, but that's how oh, I okay. ask yeah. that stupid question. So the oh, company the is Archive Social, Archive social, social. Okay, yeah. so it, it should also be corrected under right. be it resolved as well. That's social archiving there. Yeah. Yeah, it's under the whereas. And it's under a be resolved. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's easier to understand so archive social archive first, social here, so whereas social, social archiving is a process. Okay. Yeah, we'll make that consistent. Thanks for pointing that out. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments? Uh, hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed, that carries. We're at Resolution 77 of 2019, and that also would come from Finance, all the person Schumacher. Finance Committee recommends Resolution 77 2019 authorizing the City of Stoughton Director of Finance Comptroller to act on the behalf of the City of Stoughton to accept the 2019 section 5310 grant in the amount of $29,600 and move forward with the process of purchasing an additional accessible van for the shared ride taxi program. So moved. Second. Second by all the person Reeves. All the person Schumacher. So this is to get a third vehicle, I believe, to add into the fleet that takes care of the ride sharing. You can see in, 
in there. It's 30,000 rides per year on there, and I believe with uh, the grant is it's an 80-20 grant. So uh, Madison Metro picks up the 80% and we get the 20% of that. Um, and then they will actually, they'll do the purchasing of the actual van, right? We won't have to do that purchasing? Yep, this, it's a federal program and it's, it, it's being administered through Madison Metro. We're actually a sub-recipient, but Madison Metro will do all the procurement for us. And this money was budgeted in, in the CIP? Our matching portion was the $7,400, yes. Okay. Any questions for this one? Here are none. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. That takes us to uh, Ordinance 19 of 2019. And this is coming from Public Works. Uh, Public Works um, has not met um, since we've been working on this the last, well, he's been working on it for a while, but they haven't met to make a recommendation on this. Time is of the essence. So we're going to ask that uh, after we get done with the presentation, uh, we're going to ask uh, you to consider the way of the rules so we can take action of this tonight. And um, uh, Director Abair is going to kind of walk us through this. Uh, Attorney Dragney has been heavily involved with this, as many, many others on staff. Uh, Utilities director has been working on it. Planning department's been working on it. Everybody's kind of had a piece of this thing. I think we even let the finance director look at it as well. So um, all hands on deck on this one. It's a pretty important uh, ordinance that we're trying to pass here tonight. So go ahead, Brett. Yeah, this is definitely a, a group effort. Um, it does impact uh, multiple departments throughout the city and also the, the well-being of our, our citizens. Um, so what this has to do with is if you've noticed, there's quite a bit of um, underground utility work, uh, boring uh, throughout the community. Um, we acknowledge that those that provide a public service have a right to the right of way, but we need to have a, a solid uh, approach on how we regulate them. And so through Ordinance 64-9, we have shored up that ordinance to allow for us to regulate them when they come into our community. Um, so is there any questions on, on what we're trying to do here, or do we go more in depth in the ordinance changes, or Attorney Dragon, if there's any legal matters that you'd like to, to speak to. Uh, but essentially, it's just shoring up our ability to regulate them when they come into our community to uh, mostly do boring work, because we do have uh, many organizations that are essentially knocking on our door to in, uh, install services to provide uh, uh, different telecommunication services to the community, which is a good thing for our citizens. We just need to regulate how they go about their business. I just add a couple things to that. Um, so we, we started this process actually by developing um, a new uh, or a, a, a permit application form that we'd be using. And that's, I think, the next item on your agenda oh. is the actual application form. And, as a result of that process and developing that form, um, we then, well, as we were doing that, we then went and looked at the ordinance as well. And so we're making some adjustments to the ordinance, uh, both uh, to uh, conform to the new application form that, we're, uh, that, that you'll have on your agenda, but also to just address, to, to, to make improvements to, to the process, we think. And it's really clean it up because as you notice in here um, under uh, section 2b we struck public utility encumbrance because many of these organizations that are coming into our community are calling themselves utilities and so we did not want to exclude them from being a part of this so we struck utilities and we've uh, you know, we worked with stone utilities from language that also uh, protects them as well so I'll, I'll just say two, one other thing or two other things um, so, as Brett indicated, uh, uh, public utilities do have a right to use um, our local rights of way subject to our reasonable local reg uh, regulations. So um, this ordinance is asserting that regulatory authority over those who have a right to use our public rights of way. Um, 
and I can't remember the other thing I was going to say. <laughs> well, and I would add, I mean, Matt recommended that we hired an attorney from another firm, and that really kind of illustrated the importance of getting this right. There's one person that we Stoughton Utilities has worked with over the years that is really renowned in Wisconsin for their work on these types of ordinances. In fact, the League of Municipalities is also um, currently working with her on some other uh, cell type uh, ordinances and, and policies. And really talking to other communities that have gone through um, the same type of thing we are with the boring and, and these things, you know, we, we were able to learn quite a bit because one thing I learned is when when they do this work, we have to basically have diggers hotline come out and mark all the locations we're going to do the digging. And one thing I learned, well, a couple things. First of all, we don't have the staff to do a lot of the, the markings internally that would be required on a big project. And secondly, when we contracted out third party, we cannot legally recover those costs. So other communities have lost tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars during some of these conversions with the fiber optic specifically um, when they're doing their work and then on top of that um, without a strong ordinance and application process they were spending many thousands of dollars on administrative costs as well and only to have customers disappointed that really the work wasn't cleaned up sufficiently when they were done so what we're trying to do with the ordinance and the application is try to minimize uh, those types of issues occurring in Stoughton. We feel that this might be somewhat of a fluid document because the companies that we're dealing with are going to be looking for loopholes any chance they get in order to reduce their expenses and put those onto the city. And we recognize that going into this, but this is our best first attempt to put something in front of you that gives us puts us in a position where we can really at least do as much as we can based on the information we have at this time in order to protect our citizens and encourage these companies to come in here and have a seamless process to do their work I, I remembered I was gonna say um, I knew you would once I got done talking <laughs> yeah so uh, some of you or all of you may remember that we had an incident in the city of Sun Prairie last year involving an explosion downtown Sun Prairie took out a city block that was a situation where there was a uh, a subcontractor for a I think it was a telecommunications company that was involved in uh, doing work in the public right-of-way um, there was a diggers hotline call um, something happened I don't know exactly uh, who who made what mistake or there may have been more than one mistake but there was a gas line that was ruptured and that led to an explosion and a lot of damage. Very substantial um, costs, obviously, for the city and private property owners, loss of life. Um, so uh, one of the things we also did here was completely review and update the insurance and indemnification provisions of the permit application form. And it was rather complex process trying to think through um, uh, the parties that we're dealing with here because these projects are really complicated you have you have property owners you have uh, contractors you have subcontractors so you have a lot of players out there and uh, we wanted that we did the best we could I think to have a permit process that will um, that will uh, allow us to deal with the right players in the right way and have the appropriate protections in place um, as we're trying to manage a lot of people out there working in our public rights of way. We'll get more into that application permit process next, but that was really the impetus is to shore that up so we know who the players are involved because we have the person that's applying for the permit. We also have subcontractors that we need to know who they are, their contact information, then also, as Matt mentioned, the insurance indemnification and also to name us as a, an insured as well. So that's a big piece of this that we are, are through this process are going to implement. Okay. Uh, questions on ordinance, uh, President Majewski? How did you determine the uh, penalties? So those are already in there. As are far as the adequate? penalties. I'm sorry? Are they adequate? Well, so let me speak to the um, penalty provision. So penalty is almost a misnomer when it comes to uh, forfeiture provisions in an ordinance because the purpose of 
a forfeiture provision is not a punitive in nature. It's not allowed to be punitive in nature, but it's rather um, intended to reflect uh, administrative expenses. So I guess the, the, the penalty here would be come into play if we have a party who is excavating the public right-of-way or obstructing the public right-of-way without applying for and obtaining a permit. So I guess my quest one question I would have is, do, is that something we really experience? So the biggest thing is that we can pull their permit and so they can no longer go forward if they violate any of any one of our rules, I, which is which is a monetary uh, you know, but, but issue for them. What I'm asking is, is, is that enough to cover the administrative cost? So we get the administrative costs up front. Well, I think there's, there's two steps. I mean, if they don't apply? That's the question. What happens if somebody, do we have a yeah. problem with people excavating the public right of way without applying for a permit? I'm sure some minor ones, but the big ones that we're really concerned about, we don't have that issue that I'm aware of. Yeah. And they're asking us for information as well. Yeah. It, so they're this, better off to work with us. Right. Yeah, we, we don't have the issue with them coming and installing uh, a major fiber optic line without them letting us know. I just want to make sure that you cover your costs. Mm -hmm. I didn't see who was first. Well, let's let Greg go then. <laughs> All right. You guys can decide. Alderperson Jensen and then Riley and then Hirsch. Thank you. I, just a quick question. Uh, how will this affect the personal property owner, you know, the, or the homeowner, if at all? Well, there will be times when, yeah, Brett, why don't you? So these, the, the property owners, those are really small excavations. So really is going to be no more of an impact than there already is. Okay, but they will still have to go through. Absolutely, yes. Any, any excavation within the right of way has to have a permit filled out. So if they're out. doing a sanitary hookup, that they have to like redo their sanitary, they'd have to yes. go ahead and. And on the minor jobs, we really looked at their insurance as well because one thing we found was they were actually being asked to provide more than they would really need. Yes. So we've really tried to accommodate that. We, we broke it down into large and small uh, excavation projects. Okay, so I had Alderperson Riley and then Hirsch. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I know I don't believe there's anything in the revisions to the ordinance that addresses the insurance and indemnification provisions. Are those addressed in detail? I'm going to presume within the permits. That's yes. the application and permit process. Okay. Thank you. Well, the person Hirsch. Um, and I I guess I have, didn't look at the application, but for under conditions of occupancy, there is nothing in there that I can see about if you excavate that they have to um, put the basically the excavation back to like that nothing has happened part of restoration right so i guess that's what i was looking there's nothing in there i guess that's that's the application and permit process okay. so that i just thought maybe that would be in the actual yeah there is a if you if you look down the ordinance a little bit on section that refers to the application um there's a requirement that um, the permit be made uh, on a form prescribed by the Director of Public Works. Actually, we're going to ask the City Council to approve that. And so the uh, application uh, includes numerous requirements that you'll see when we get to that, and it's binding on the applicant. All of the requirements are binding on the applicant. Okay. So it doesn't need to be part put in this part of it? I, didn't, I don't think so, no. Okay. So uh, if there... Are there any more questions on the ordinance? Otherwise, we're going to request that you waive the rules so we can take action tonight. I would move to waive the rules. Oh. Okay. I heard yeah. President Majewski. And who was the second? No, she Reeves. Okay. okay. Seconded by Reeves. And then a, a motion to waive the rules does take a two-thirds vote. Um, any questions about? Not debatable. Huh? Not debatable. No. So all in favor of waiving the rules, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. So that takes us to the actual ordinance then, as if it were a second reading. Are there any questions on the ordinance before we vote on it? Hearing none, all in favor of the ordinance, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. Thank you. And that takes us to Resolution 78. And that would be the application, and that's also coming from Public Works. Go ahead. So currently we do not have essentially an application and a permit that are separate. It's just essentially an application that's a 
permit within it. So what they have to do now is submit an application that's drawn up here in your packet. And we spend a lot of time and effort to make sure we capture all the information that we need to know who is actually doing the work in town, oh. who their contact information is. Um, also, as we talked about, all the insurance requirements have to be submitted uh, before we approve the application and submit or give them their permit. Um, again, we worked with all the different departments uh, putting this together to make sure that we try to cover all of our bases and any potential loopholes that may be out there. Uh, we try to shore everything up. Um, so again, part of this is also to recruit some of our administrative costs and also uh, restoration costs into the future. They are required to restore um, their excavation uh, after they complete their work, but we know that there could be some restoration, restoration work that takes place five, 10 years down the road. And so we do take some of those funds and keep those in our general fund to essentially complete that work at a later date. Are there any questions on the application? I was just going to note in response to all the person Hirsch's question, if you look at the certification in the application, which is section nine, the applicant is agreeing to uh, a series of things, including uh, a number of provisions that relate to restoration. And also notifying the public, which was a big thing, um, that if they do uh, some sort of level of excavation, there's threshold, thresholds in here. <coughs> who they must notify and, and how they must do that. Other person, Reese? Um, and I, I, I know somebody asked about the subcontractors, and when I read this, I couldn't find it, but there's a lot of words in here. Is it on so, somewhere that you can So the, the front page is where they would fill that information out. So there's an applicant, and then there's a contractor, and then uh, section two, subcontractor, one and two. Oh. So essentially, they could have the applicant plus three subs, essentially, the contractor and two subs. Thank you. Okay. Well, the person, Riley. Thank you. Um, Brett, where, where did the, uh, how did you come up with the figures? Are those kind of standard with respect to the insurance and indemnification numbers? Yeah, that all came through uh, risk management and also working <coughs> with CIVMIC, our insurance company, on the, the level of coverage. Thank you. Other well, person, Hirsch. Um, go with. Um, the person I asked you before is the fee structure enough to cover all your your costs and so we're not going to go in the hole by all these requests no that the the fees that we can collect because we cannot collect fees uh, for doing uh, underground marking uh, but for our administrative costs we felt we we beat this round pretty good and we feel we can recoup our costs for that uh, as far as the um, the marking, I think we won't recover our costs with that. Um, utilities has more costs associated with marking than, than we would, but we cannot recover for those costs, only our administrative costs. So we the do have hotline we can't correct. ever recover. Correct. But we do have built into it um, for our large projects that uh, we do keep track of our time to um, administer these, and we can get our money back uh, by our, you know, how much time we devote into it. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Kirsten Johnson, I'd um, make a motion uh, to approve resolution 78 2019, approving an application form and permit form for permits uh, to excavate in the public right of way. Second. Okay, there's a second by Riley. And uh, going back to Ordinance 19, I, I'm not sure if we made a motion actually approve the ordinance we waive the rules so that's right we only waive the rules for the first one we have to waive the rules for the second one too, don't we well we didn't actually make a motion to take the action right. so holly pointed that out so we have to we still have to vote on that as well i rescind my so i mean do you want to make do you want to do that one first I'm sure i'll make the motion okay. to uh, recommend the ordinance uh, 2019 uh, for okay so we're gonna He's making a motion for the ordinance because we missed that, so we need a second for that. Second. Uh, Hiley? All right. Um, all in favor of the ordinance, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. Okay, that carries. And then okay, no, Greg no. also made a motion for the, for the application, R78, and that was seconded by Riley. Any more discussion on the application? Alderperson Hiley? 
Uh, just wanted to. I, I noticed uh, degradation is misspelled a few times on uh, exit, Exhibit B. Just to double check the spelling on that. Attachment B. Exhibit B, which I think there's. It's the last page. Yeah. Make that correction. Thank yep, you. we can do that. Correct. Anything else? Cool. Uh, hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. <coughs> Thank you. And everyone else that worked on it, which is pretty much half a city hall and then some, mm -hmm. <laughs> half a utilities as well. Thanks, Brett. Um, R79 of 2019 is coming from uh, CACP. This was back from February. Jean, can you introduce this one? I'm happy to introduce this. CACP putting forth the resolution authorizing and directing proper city officials to adopt a policy relating to attending city meetings via remote access. Second. So a motion and I a had moved. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And a second by was it Hirsch? Yep. Thank you. Um, who would like uh, have you reviewed this one much? Okay, go ahead. So um, I wasn't on the committee at this time, but I read it and it reads as if people can attend standing and non standing committees remotely, though I wonder if that needs to be discussed. It's just a question I have of what remote really means. Like, is it a phone? Is it with FaceTime? Is it so? I don't know. And maybe you kept it open just as long as a person's voice is good enough. And that city council meetings cannot be attended by remotely. People must be there in person. And if somebody, and there was an exception for planning, that if um, they can attend remotely for participation and discussion purposes, but would not be able to vote um, or count towards the quorum. That's correct. All the person Hirsch. Because I was on this committee before Jane took over. Um, I think we, and all the person Reeves too, I think what we, we left remote access kind of open because we don't want to keep on, we don't know what the future holds with respect to remote access. Right now it's just, Right now we have the capability of, you know, just phone, but we don't know what we'll have the capability of before, and so we didn't want to have to continue to do that. And I also want to make sure that <clears throat> when this was first brought up into the council, we have planning and RDA as being part of this part. RDA was taken out because they're under their own authority, so RDA cannot be subject to these rules and I just wanted to make that clear. All the person reads. And the, the other thing I was going to add is um, it mentions if reason, reasonable arrangements can be made which does so in some situations the room may not be set up to have you know Skype or something like that so it could be phone and that's why we didn't want to say it has to be one way or the other. It really is about what the room can accommodate and if someone can be heard reasonably <coughs> part of the conversation. So. so in asking a question then, um, sure. was um, this policy, yes, is this policy being thought of as in actuality it would probably be a speakerphone on someone's cellular phone at this time no, just have. for us to help understand or what would be the means well we do have speaker phone setups in some of the conference rooms so uh, it's mm -hmm. again like, it all depends on what where you are where we are what's going on and I think it was initiated to give especially at the committee some flexibility because right now in our policy we have uh, one person from each district on the standing committee so there's four council members on the committee and three out of the four have to be there to have a quorum what the policy does is it allows one member to call in so if somebody was sick enough where they shouldn't go to the meeting and get everyone else sick they could still call in and participate and vote 
or if somebody got stuck in a traffic jam but they still wanted to be part of the meeting they could do so or if they were out of town for work or something like that so we really wanted to give some flexibility we, we still want to encourage people to go to the meeting so that's why we limited it to one and we also excluded <coughs> the city council but really the idea is to make sure that we can have a quorum at our standing committee meetings which does come in play periodically for unforeseen circumstances so this gives us that flexibility to still conduct those meetings especially when there's when there's time time sensitive issues thank you for the explanation of what remote means and it sounds very wise all right does anybody have any questions or comments on this and this kind of went back and forth a couple <coughs> times to get to this point so I think there was a fair amount of work put in and it was all good work and a lot of that was based on feedback from the council so certainly the committee I've been on it the whole time uh, we appreciate the council feedback all the person Jensen yeah first uh, I want to thank the committee for doing some hard work on this um, however I out of principle just cannot uh, support this uh, I believe that we were we were elected uh, and that made a that was a commitment that we made by putting ourselves up uh, for election and uh, I believe it was our responsibility to be there um, it's just a, a matter of principle for me so I'm going to vote against it okay. well, person Hirsch uh, thank you I, I guess this brought up because of what uh, mayor Swadley talked about is that there are some times that we need to have a meeting and our as much as uh, elders would love to be there they have different responsibilities in their lives they have jobs they have family they might get sick but we need to do our business this allows the council and subcommittees to actually do their business when different life events take a council member away and so to me it it makes sure that we are serious about our jobs and that a committee meeting doesn't get canceled because of some council members work or you know illness or whatever life throws at people and so by them being responsible and saying hey I can't physically be there <coughs> to the committee chair and say but I want to be there remotely allows that whole committee who is committed to getting work done to be able to go forward so I think this this uh, new policy is really important for us to continue um, when I first got on council the majority of council members were retirees that they have a different things so now the majority of this council are active in other jobs and so I think to keep up with the times and to keep with this new council we need to have this so yeah. I encourage you guys all to vote for it and I can tell you from personal experience before I was elected as mayor there was more than one time where I drove from downtown Chicago <coughs> to Stoughton only to get to a committee meeting and other committee members couldn't be there and the meeting didn't take place and I had to turn around and drive back down to Chicago the next morning so I, I think that this provides all of us the flexibility um, that we need to accommodate our busy schedules so I think it's a good thing I think it's something we can monitor if we feel that maybe people are abusing it we can certainly revisit it if that's the case but I, I trust that everybody here is, is going to make as many meetings as they possibly can in person go ahead question for Alder Jensen um, given what the mayor just said about monitoring is there something that would um, some statements or at least I'm not sure the form of that for this meeting but would discussion of how it could be monitored and or held to a standard help you look at this policy favorably I would agree with what's being said here. You know, I, I do see that there's there's uh, good points to this. It's just a matter of uh, principle for me. I've been on council, maybe on old school or whatever. I don't know, but it's just it just seems to me that that 
we need to make every effort to be at these committees and this gives people an out and that's that's the only thing that I'm I'm objecting to okay. all the person Caravello I'm just curious how common or how not common a policy like this is in other communities you know are we breaking new ground with this or is this something that's done all over the place does anybody have any experience with something like that um, always look at the yeah, attorney yeah. Right? well I'm, I work with a number of communities and um, um, so I don't have personal experience with another community ha that has expressly adopted this kind of a policy as a standing policy I have um, uh, seen communities that have on a more of an ad hoc basis allowed uh, for people to appear remotely uh, under circumstances where they anticipated that they need they needed to allow that to achieve a quorum and so it's more of an ad hoc uh, kind of arrangement it's not something that I see commonly I think uh, I think the fact that the common council meeting itself is something where the policy does not allow for that and this is more of a committee issue to me seems consistent with what I've seen elsewhere where at the governing body level you don't tend it's very rare to see uh, uh, an older person or a trustee appear at a governing body meeting remotely that doesn't happen all that often um, but I have seen it uh, from time to time on more of an ad hoc basis at a committee level all right Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Hear none. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Nope. One opposed. That carries. Thank you. <coughs> Item number 18, R80 of 2019. This comes from the clerk's office. Um, so this ordinance comes from when Nicole Weisinger um, resigned earlier this year. The council um, chose to appoint someone to fill that vacancy for the remainder of 19 until we could have a special election in April of 2020. The special election just means that that seat wouldn't normally be up for an election at that time. Um, so then um, in 2020, that person would run, run for an actually a one year term. This is exactly what we did with um, Alder Riley's seat. So this is just confirming that this is what we were going to do. Any questions on the resolution? Otherwise, we're looking for a motion. So moved. Moved by Hailey. Is there a second? Second. Second by Lagaki. Any questions or comments? There are none. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. Move to adjourn. Motion second. Adjourned by Jensen. A second by all the person Reeves. <coughs> Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. Thank you. Have a good night. Yes.